Good evening, everybody. <laughs> and want to talk to everybody. Um, so, yeah, thanks again. My name is June McDonald. I'm the marketing director for Hive Waterloo Region. And back there is Stephanie, if she wants to wave. Say hello. So she's kind of, she will talk to you, but otherwise she's not working tonight. Um, <laughs> um, I want to say thank you to Gada and Grace, our amazing volunteers for helping out tonight and and always <laughs> right and without further ado all right well let's uh, get this party started as they say um, and I would like to invite uh, Victoria Rabb who is director of communications at the city of Kitchener um, Victoria came out to a, a Hive Waterloo Region uh, Learn to Code event at one of the public libraries. And she brought her daughter, and that got her thinking about how can parents and her as a mom, how can she influence her daughter to keep pursuing an interest in technology? So Victoria's going to talk about her personal experience. Please help us, help me welcome Victoria Rapp. started with uh, coding uh, or understanding technology is that I have a seven-year-old daughter and uh, my career is I'm director of corporate communications and marketing at the city of Kitchener and it's a career that I came into because I love words and I love writing and I love being creative I love storytelling I love thinking outside the box um, but it's also a career that I came into because um, in 1992 which ages me considerably my uh, grade 10 math teacher uh, and I had a conversation. I was in second semester and I was struggling. I'd always been a, a great, an A student and I was really struggling with some concepts that uh, first semester and I went to him and I said like I'm really struggling. I need some help and he said you know you just really need to focus on about a 60 average. Girls really are good at math and that stuck, <laughs> so that stuck with me from grade 10 and from then on kind of pursued a career that allowed me to explore creativity through words as opposed to through numbers. As much as I love problem solving, I was afraid that I couldn't do it because girls can't do math. And so as I watched my daughter, I'm really concerned about the fact that girls can't do coding is the 1992 version of girls can't do math. So one day I was uh, at her parent-teacher interview and she's a great student and she comes with me to those things because my husband works evenings. And uh, I said, I'm going to talk to your teacher. She said, okay, no problem. I'm going to go over here and code. And I was like, oh, you're going to what? I, I was so shocked. I was like, you're seven. I don't even know what you're talking about. And I quickly realized that she is entering a world that I know very little about. And I need to figure out how to keep her inspired and how to not pass on those fears that I still carry with me 25 years later that girls can't do math or that I can't help her because I was bad at math. And this sort of stigma that goes along with that is really frightening. So luckily I work at the city of Kitchener and I know a lot about a little, um, or a little about a lot I should say, and I know a little about High Waterloo Region. So when we were at the public library, which is like one of the best resources in our entire city, uh, and I saw June and Steph uh, there, I, I said to Stella, do you, do you want to go over there? It looks like they're doing some coding. She's like, okay, sure. And I was really excited because it was two women that were teaching the coding. And I thought, you know, here's an opportunity for her to see other women doing something that I may not be able to help her with. So she spent maybe 15 minutes doing some work with June uh, and Steph. And then we had a pedicure appointment, believe it or not. So we went to do our pedicure. And she said, Mom, I really want to go back to the library. I want to do some more coding. And I said, OK, great. Let's go. Let's do it. So we went back to the library and, and spent a little more time there until I think they were finished their session. And we got home and she spent another hour on the computer um, looking up Scratch, which was the app that Steph had taught her to use. And I was watching her and I was watching her do all these problem solving things and making her little guys move and she did about six of them and then she had a friend come over and she's like, you have to see what I learned. And she was showing her little friend 
Claire how to do this, and I was so inspired by it. Um, so we spent a little more time learning and uh, and talking about you know what it meant to do that and why she liked it and why she spent time on the computer. Uh, and I realized that I have a lot of learning to do myself if I want to keep her engaged and inspired. So uh, we've looked up other apps, and I'm learning along with her now, uh, which is really exciting for me to understand what happens behind the scene on these games. So when she's playing um, The Floor is Lava, I can say to her, you know how that guy's jumping? You're making him jump because somebody else did all that coding in the background to, to follow your instructions. And I see the light go off in her head. Um, but I know that that too will be soon the most I know about coding is following the tutorials online with her. So knowing there's a place in our community that we can go to, um, High Waterloo Region, for these kinds of activities is something that I think is going to make the entire difference in her growing up, in her having confidence in the classroom, in her being able to show her friends and teach her friends what she's learning, but more importantly to prepare her for a world of careers that don't even exist today. And I think that's what is the most important thing for, for me to have for her, is that there are no limits to what she can achieve, there are no gender rules in terms of what, what world she belongs in, and that she can be as confident in the classroom teaching her friends as she is um, you know, at a Hive meetup or at a drop-in center or at Discovery Square in downtown Kitchener. Um, and that if I don't have all the answers, that's okay right now because all of you do, and hopefully all of you are gonna be the people that help me inspire her um, to continue to learn. So I'm really excited about the other speakers today, particularly the teacher who's gonna talk about coding and, the, and erasing your digital footprint. Um, and I'm really excited to be here to put some faces to the people who are going to be uh, the resources in our community that help her become the best she's going to be. So thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I think we're all just trying to do the best we can as parents in our 40s, but um, I'm sure all of you don't remember 1992. Um, so thank you for having me. Good evening. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't, feedback. I don't know how well this works. I'm going to try turning this off. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, I teach grade three, grade four, generally in that area. I originally taught a five-six class, started integrating tech a lot into my class, and moved back down to the younger grades and thought, why not? So I, I tried it with the younger kids. Found it very effective, and then coding became a thing that was <coughs> code.org came out, and so it made me think, hey, I should try this with my students, and that was about three, four years ago. So I, a lot of people often ask why coding, why do this, because it's a lot of extra time in the classroom, and it gives the students real job skills for a market that is continuing to build and grow that didn't exist before and even now there's jobs that aren't being filled and that's just going to build exponentially as, as the future rushes towards us. Uh, understanding the digital world they live in, they're growing up in a different world than we grew up in. I grew up with the Atari 2600 and if, if you, I don't know if you're like me, but if, if you're like me then you probably liken your, your childhood to whatever video game system was popular at the time. And so as time went on, things changed a lot. And nowadays, it's a different world than when we even grew up. So their digital world is huge. And they're so used to just consuming in that world instead of creating it and building it. So I want them to feel like they can have an impact and build in that world. Um, students in my class, at the beginning of the year, we start with coding right away. Uh, we start with it usually in subjects like math and language. And we just build our skills, always working together with a partner, learning those collaborative uh, skills. As they move along, they learn how to work in a team. The big one for me is perseverance because they're so used to being told how to do things. And the first thing I teach them is that I'm not going to tell them how to do something. 
or tell them what to think. So they have to think for themselves. So this is a huge one that coding builds for them because they try some code, run it on the stage. If it doesn't work, they go back, they change one thing at a time. They learn some really good computational thinking skills that are, are useful for them. So as they work through that, they become better critical and creative thinkers. And they have flexibility in their learning. Um, students will often coach other students. So we have other classes come and we'll teach them how to code. Uh, two of my students this year, they taught a class in the near north how to do coding. Uh, an hour of code time, they went on live with the class and ran them through a whole tutorial on how to do things. So the leadership opportunities are there for them too, where they solidify the learning. Um, I'll start with math and coding because it's an easy fit. And I try to start here and then build it outwards. And in this example here, we have a trapezoid that is doing a rotation. And so with my students this year, the big difference I noticed was that they saw it in a different way because they've been doing so much coding. So what they saw was that it was turning 90 degrees each time, like a sprite would in a coding program. And instead of describing it that it's making a turn or something, they literally used coding language to explain how it turned, which was really cool. And then I threw out a really hard question. I didn't know if someone would figure it out. I said, well, how many times can a shape do a translation or a slide from one point? A thousand, a million. And then one student said, no, 360. Can I go code it? And I said, sure, go ahead. So he went off and other students are talking about other things and figuring things out. And then he comes back to us in about five minutes and he put this together to talk about how many different ways of shape can slide from one point. Oops, sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. Let's try that again. Okay, here we go. So and slide in 360 different degrees. Can you show us what you coded? So because we've been doing coding... You don't see the slides that it's making? He could see computationally what was happening in his mind. How many people think that's pretty cool? Yeah, me too. Nice job. And good, clean coding. And I won't play the whole video, but it goes all the way around and it goes 360 times it repeats. Just for time, I won't... Uh, okay, we'll both jump back in. Okay, so I start with math, but I, I also want to take it into other subjects. So I brought it into science. The perseverance that is developed through coding is huge. Uh, we, I saw this video online this year of a father and a son building Leonardo da Vinci's bridge, which has no parts to it, it's just wood and it all slots together and creates an arc that is strong and stable. And I didn't even know if they could do this, but I thought, well, let's get some uh, wooden spears and see what happens. And so there's a lot of failure involved, but they kept with it, they never gave in, they never stopped trying. And they were successful. They actually built it and got it working, which is really cool. Their flexibility shows as well in the way that they code. They took their understanding of coding from one platform and they applied it to Sphero EDU, which is a completely different coding language, to code robots. And so then, building on Leonardo's bridge, they started to build with straws, which is not the best material, but they had to make it strong and stable so they could code the robot across the bridge. Uh, then they took those same spheros and they used them to power motors on boats. I've gone past time, so I'm just going to skip this video. <laughs> um, the one for me though, and we talked about uh, girls in the first, in the first presentation, and, and I want all the students in my class engaged and interested in it. I want to include everyone. And so this year, I, I wanted to stretch myself as a teacher. I'm not a strong art teacher, but I thought, what if I bring coding to art? Will I get more people engaged? So I looked at Kandinsky's abstract art, and I thought, he's trying to represent the movement of music in his visual art. And I thought, what if we took that, and we did it in scratch, and we coded the shapes to move? And so this is what the students came up with. They built the shapes themselves and then they coded them to make different movements to the music. By doing this this year, I got 100% buy in, and every student in my class was enjoying coding. And every student became more proficient at it because they could find something that was of interest to them that we combined with the code 
to make it good for them for their learning. Thank you. how it works with the existing curriculum, uh, building on language and math. And there's language in the math curriculum that is, is computational thinking. So taking that language that is computational thinking and just applying it with coding is an example. So that's, that's where we started. And yeah, I haven't had any real flack actually. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I got a question. Yeah. So this really works with eight-year-olds? Well, I just showed you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'm doing today is a um, basically a 75-minute talk cut down to five minutes. <laughs> um, I did this for um, uh, for uh, for the Toronto Literacy Association. So we're going to talk about your hidden trail online. Um, okay, are we ready? Here we go. And it's not okay. Uh, okay, so um, just in case, I'm going to go really fast. Like it's basically <laughs> 10 seconds per slide. If you need it, it's bit.ly hidden trail, and you'll be able to find it, and it's all there and all the links because I can't demo anything. So, first things first. We were all told when we were kids never take candy from a stranger, right? <laughs> By the way, don't look at me, look at the slides. Uh, <laughs> so, the whole point here is, as kids, we do learn, but as adults, it's a whole different story. Uh, as adults, we're not interested in having any information given to us. We know better already. But what the talk I'm doing today is really about getting us ready to understand what the new internet is looking like for our kids. So this conversation I'm having with you today is geared towards those that are still getting used to the idea of social media and putting yourself online. So, first question that always comes up, of course, is privacy. Now, I do want to let you know, privacy should never really always be expected. It was just harder to get. For example, if you wanted to know who voted for who, or who was registered, you could simply go down to City Hall and find that information. So this is a census data from the US from 1920. If you're willing to go to the post office, you are able to find it. The problem with today is it's easier. We now have Google. Google lets us search for anything we want and it makes it super easy to find. So, a famous quote that's out there now is privacy is dead and social media holds the smoking gun. So that idea being, really, we are all out there. We have expanded our circles, our social circles. We share so much that anybody who does a Google search on us will find out what it is we're thinking and what kind of sandwich we ate last Tuesday. Okay, that was a joke. Somebody laughed. Thank you. Remember Twitter was all about what sandwich you ate or photographing your plate? Um, so. Try this, so a lot of you are holding mobile devices right now. I always tell my students to do this. Google yourself. The vanity search is one of the most important things you could possibly do for yourself. You need to know what other people see when they look for you. The other thing I do is I Google my kids. Um, I need to know what they're doing online because sometimes it isn't the brightest thing in the world. Um, Snapchat has become really good for kids, in all honesty. It might have been called the sexting app at one time. 
but kids are using it instead of Facebook because they do not want a permanent record. So my stepson uh, sent me a video of him at the St. Patrick's Day uh, event down by the university there. Um, and I looked at it and it was a bit appalling, to say the least. But the next day when I confronted him, he said, where's your proof? And I opened up Snapchat and it was gone. <laughs> so, two minutes and then here we go. So take a look at this photograph. This is what, as a science teacher, I used to present this with kids and I used to always talk about inference. What are you inferring from this? So when you look at this, you'll see one set of footprints coming along, you'll see another set of footprints coming along, some event takes place, and somebody leaves. The first question or answer that always comes up, somebody ate somebody else. Then I say, but look at the steps. They get wider here. Maybe it's mom picking up the baby and taking it home. Or I say, what happens if this happened over a few days? What if there's a dead animal sitting here, and this bear comes along, has a snack, and leaves, but this bird comes along two or three days later, has a snack, and flies away? We don't know what the story is. We just see the footprints. So when we talk about leaving a digital footprint, I always tell my students that it's important that they cultivate that footprint. Because, let's face it, in the future, your digital footprint will carry more weight than anything you might include in a record. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to make it. So, uh, with that in mind, 78% of recruiters right now are Googling people who are actually applying for work. And everybody's doing it. But um bum bum Thank you. So, where's it going to be? It's going to be on social media. Yes, you can ignore it. But what happens when you do? This is one of my favorite examples. Toronto District School Board ignored Twitter for a while, three years to be exact, and somebody else signed up with that account and actually started tweeting at the Toronto District School Board for three years. <laughs> so I always say, make sure people have a positive image of you. So I register everything. These are all my domains. They all point to this one, but I buy them because I am interested. I also sign up for every social media site so that somebody's not tweeting as me, and I always try to get the same name. Why? Take a look at these numbers. These are out of date. This is from 2015. This number is now 2 billion users a month. Unique. So, internet, social media are very, very important. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of trail are you leaving? So, I'm gonna leave you with just a few websites to go home and check. Stock scan, one of my favorites. This shows you what your Facebook account is leaking to the public. So if you want to check what you are showing publicly on Facebook, go to Stock Scan. It's how stalkers find you. The other one I go to is mypermissions.org. If you've ever tried to find uh, where the permissions page for sharing things online, I can never find them. So mypermissions.org takes you directly to the permission setting page so that you can st start actually protecting yourself. The other thing I do is I often will go and I explain to people about sharing photographs online. If you have nothing better to do, you have to check out this website. It's called I Know Where Your Cat Lives. What they did is they took one million cat photographs from around the world and plotted them on Google Maps using the EXIF data. As I say EXIF, people go, what? EXIF data tells you right here the date the photo was taken, what it was called, what device took the picture, even tells you uh, what the shutter speed was, and it tells you the GPS location. So instead of putting your kids' pictures on this website, they use cats, because that would just be creepy. So I always tell people, when you share your photos online, you might want to start using a different app. So I use Google Photos because it has this line right here, remove geolocation items shared by link. So when I share my photos online, I'm not sharing my GPS information. So, I'm going to stop there because I'm only half done, so. <laughs> oh, questions. Yeah, if you have any questions for Carlos. Karen. Yes, I do. And the other place you want to go is uh, my other favorite search engine is DuckDuckGo because it has no history of any of your searches, so you will see the results that anybody in the world sees. So DuckDuckGo, non, non, whatever it's called. Yes, no tailoring of your search text. So DuckDuckGo. Any other questions? 
Oh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. All right. Next, we're going to change gears, and I'm going to invite Justin Watkins from the city of Kitchener, who was he's here somewhere. Oh, there he is. Yay. Okay. So, Justin is interim manager, business relations, and social solutions delivery. So I'm Justin Watkins, I'm with the City of Kitchener, Tori and I work together. Um, since I joined the city in January 2015, I've been working on a, a little project of ours that's now become known as Digital Kitchener, as June had mentioned, uh, was approved by council back in January. Um, and before I start as well, I want a little bit more. How's that? Like about another six inches. <laughs> See, well my head's right in the mic in the speaker, so it's a lot better. How about that? Better? Okay. Oh yeah? A lot better? Okay. So I want to thank Steph and June uh, as well before I start for a different reason. Um, they've been with me or Digital Kitchener since the beginning. They've helped us out a lot. And uh, this is meetup number three. For, for, you know what? So this is meetup number three. Awesome job. This is the second meetup I've ever been to, period. So this is really, really great. Um, so Digital Kitchener. Um, really what Digital Kitchener is, it's a bit of a strategic plan for the city. Uh, it's really about the city that we want to work towards uh, with regard to uh, tech and civic tech and information. Um, and it's really built around four pillars. So becoming a city that's more connected. So really find the ways that we can turn our traditional uh, infrastructure assets into smarter assets. And a great example of that that we're doing this year is we're creating one of Canada's first citywide IoT networks, which is really, really cool. Um, it's about becoming more innovative, so it's really about how can we do a better job of leveraging uh, the great ecosystem that we have here in Kitchener and Waterloo Region of uh, brilliant thinkers and innovators and community builders uh, to make really cool things happen. Um, some of you might have heard, uh, last Friday we announced our first uh, Innovation Lab Activator or Director at Communitech for the new Municipal Lab we're opening, uh, Carl Allen Monty, a uh, super cool guy, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with him. Uh, so that's one of the initiatives we're doing uh, under the innovative theme. On Demand uh, is another one of the, the four pillars. Uh, it's really about how can we do a better job as a municipality to give you the data and the services you want online when and where you want it. And then finally, the fourth one that I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, really deals with inclusion. And sometimes I need to step back and, and, and make better sense of it for myself too because when I first started hearing about digital inclusion and the digital divide, it was very, very interesting for me because my background, for those of you that know me, is not in tech. Uh, I'm, I'm a poli-sci graduate. Um, my background's in service improvement and service delivery. So when I was looking at what cities like Chicago and Chattanooga and Austin were doing on this file, I thought, wow, this is a really interesting perspective and something that really demonstrated to me that here in Canada, um, we still have a lot of work to do, but in the States, I think their level of maturity has a lot more to do with, you know, the degree to which municipalities have control over school boards and things like that. But then when I started pulling it back and we started doing outreach here in Kitchener, and people in Waterloo Region were talking about it, I started to get a little bit frightened because I didn't know what it meant. Um, and more importantly, I, the, I think the thing that was most uh, interesting about it was in Canada, we don't have a ton of that guidance yet that really demonstrates to us what role as local governments and governments should be playing in this space. And there was one, a little bit of a model that I just wanted to, uh, to, to share with you tonight that comes from Kansas City, because I think it really demonstrates um, what uh, the implications for the digital divide and digital inclusion really are. And what they talk about is that there's essentially four or five kind of 
cyclical interactions that that uh, occur on a daily basis. So when we talk about the digital divide, really one of the levels that people interact uh, that might come from lower income families um, or just people that don't have access to either the internet or technology is really first and foremost on more of a transactional or consumer basis. So think about everything you do every day from your banking to your online shopping. You do that online now. It's become an accepted norm and an expected norm. Another way that it occurs is through learning. So I know here in Waterloo Region, the public school board, last year gave Chromebooks to all their students, but do we know for sure that every night when they go home, they can actually have the connectivity to use their Chromebooks? Um, digital citizenry. So I know at the city, uh, for example, we're very interested in, in e-participation and surveys, and uh, our, our great mayor, Barry Rubanovic, he's very active on Twitter. It's a way to communicate with people. Entrepreneurs, people sell things online. So there's a lot of implications for the digital divide that we haven't quite understood yet. But really what the theme of inclusion means for the city of Kitchener is really about what is our role in uh, removing these barriers. And really what we've landed on is about providing opportunities or finding ways to provide opportunities in a meaningful way to provide more equitable access to support digital literacy, so groups like Hive that have been with us since the beginning, um, and creating uh, more of a regional conversation around what digital uh, inclusion can mean. So one of the things we want to do is we want to collect more data to figure out what the landscape in Waterloo region actually looks like in terms of the digital divide. And then secondly, we want to work with groups like Hive and KPL to better align the existing services and programming that are out there to provide more opportunities to people. So with that, I'm going to cut it off there. And I don't have, uh, I have a couple co copies of the strategy, but I thought this group might like our device stickers. So I bought a bunch of them. And if you'd like one for your computer or your cell phone, come and see me. So, since that's pretty new, uh, we have talked to Waterloo a little bit about what opportunities might be because they're partnering with IBM on their new lab there. But I think for right now, what we're really focused on is ramping up our lab that's going to be at the Tech Hub in Kitchener with that IoT uh, or focus on it because that alone is going to generate um, the pilot projects that we develop through the lab and then ultimately bring out to operate or run our network in the real world. That's going to start creating data like the second we flip the switch, right? So we need to understand what that data means, what data we want to collect, and then how we use it. Make sure you find IoT firms. IoT firms? Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. No, so IoT is the Internet of Things. And essentially, if I was to try and give you my very layman's approach to it, it's taking things, can be anything, and a lot of the solutions haven't even yet been defined yet, but things like our street lights. So we, um, one of the ways we're putting uh, this network together is through an LED retrofit of our street lights. So we're also going to incorporate sensors that will allow our street lights to essentially go on the internet. So then we'll be able to do really cool things like right now if a light starts to fail, we actually rely on people to sometimes to, to call and tell us, right? Now the second that, that infrastructure even starts to think about failing, we can generate a work order and it can let us know and we can plan for it ahead of time. Another interesting thing it's going to let us do is be able to dim the lights right from day one to 70%. So by the time that that asset reaches the end of its life, we can crank it back up and we can get better use out of it. So we can do things like that for, for traffic lights, for trash cans, um, like I said, buses, transit, like there are infinite possibilities. But it's taking those assets and putting them online. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to comment. I just want to say thank you so much to KPL. One of the most impressive things I've ever seen there was being able to sign the internet out yeah. from the library. Yeah. That has been one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. So, and one of the first in Canada, yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, I part of your menu on being able to be able to do it that way. And it's really thank you about inclusion for those that don't have access. Thanks, Justin. There's a, a um, study that has started, and Dash is the project coordinator for. And actually, I'll let you go ahead and introduce it and, and uh, share with everybody what's been happening. So Hive has been the community partner, and otherwise, this is a research study that's being conducted between three universities. Dasha,
this better? Okay. So, closer? It's better? I'll try to project. Right, so the project that you mentioned is called the Collaborative Solutions for an Equitable Urban Change Project, and thank you for that previous presentation because that was the best segue ever into this one. Uh, so, to start off, I think that we can all, if, if we've worked or lived or even gone to visit downtown Kitchener, we can all agree that it's really easy to point at something, pretty much anything these days, and say, that has changed in the last year, or that's different. So there's a lot, there's been a lot of urban change ramping up. I mean, it's been going on for years and years, but in recent years, it's been very dramatic. And urban change means really different things to different people, depending on who they are and where they come from. So for some people, they might barely notice it. And it might be just going into a new cafe that popped up and they don't really think about it, or being annoyed that a road is closed. And then for other people, it's a really big deal. Maybe they are, they're moving their business into a bigger place, or a smaller place, because they can't afford the rent, or maybe they're paying higher rent at home if they live in downtown Kitchener. But in general, when we talk about growth and development in downtown Kitchener, we tend to equate growth with good. So it's kind of... A, it's the thing that we do. Our, our society moves really fast, and when things are growing, things are developing, they're good. And that's a lot, a lot of times it's also a very techie mindset. Um, and so the question that comes from, is the growth always good, is are there better ways to do growth than we're doing right now? Are, are there better ways to get involved in growth? Because for some people in the community, they say that there are some impacts of the growth that's going on right now that are negative for some people. And instead of growth, they use the word gentrification. So let's hang on a minute and say and ask why am I talking about gentrification at this meeting instead of digital literacy or tech. So tech actually is, is really important in the urban change and growth in two ways. So one way is actually the digital Kitchener strategy and similar initiatives in general of digitalizing things and having you know, tech become more a bigger part of our lives. And the thing with that is, while inclusivity is a really honorable goal, it's also really important to ask questions at all points from, you know, conception of the strategy to actually implementing it. Is it serving everyone? And who is it missing? And are there any people being left out? And the second way that tech is involved in urban change is that the rapid growth of the tech industry in downtown Kitchener is actually one of the drivers of it. So tech companies are opening up. Employees who work there want to be closer to work, so they're moving downtown Kitchener, which makes sense. So there's no more need for housing, so condos are being developed, and so on and so forth. And so that's one of the drivers that's turning the wheel of urban change. And urban change is a really complex process, so don't get the wrong idea that I'm blaming tech or saying that one person or two people or two CEOs are causing this, because it's a very complex process, but as with all complex processes, there's always a chance for unintended consequences to happen. So based on this, uh, we partnered with Hive last year to create this project and to us it seemed that a really important thing when analyzing urban change was to look at not how it looks on paper but actually people's experiences of it. So we made a project in three stages. One was a workshop that we hosted in June. One is a photo, uh, photo post activity that we're doing right now and the third will be an exhibition. So the idea behind our project was for it to be really collaborative and to work together across all sectors with all stakeholders in downtown Kitchener, no matter who they are, to develop solutions. So we invited a whole range of people to a workshop from residents to activists to arts and culture people to, to people who work in tech to government all over the place and we actually the feedback we got was really positive. We held this workshop in June at KPL and people seemed really impressed with the diversity of people that we got out and they had some really great conversations that and a lot of materials were generated at this workshop that we're still looking at right now. So one of the key things we learned was actually the importance of arts and culture in the vibrancy of a city and in attracting people to the city which is actually not important only to the people in arts and culture, but to people in tech as well. They were saying, when we recruit people, we want the city to be vibrant. We don't want it to be like San Francisco, uh, where it seemed to deteriorate as things like arts and culture were kind of left to the wayside. Another important thing came actually from the tech people who said, we're not actually doing this on purpose, guys. Like They were really concerned about this. And it's true, because a lot of employees come in and they're young, they're fresh out of university, they just don't know about opportunities to get involved in downtown. And that actually also causes them to feel excluded as well. So when I'm talking about exclusion due to gentrification, it can happen both ways. Uh, thirdly, 
Also, some people mentioned that while to some people who don't really feel the effects of urban change, it might seem kind of like a faraway problem. There are others who are experiencing it right now, particularly marginalized communities. And so that's why it's really important to address right now and not kind of leave it, up, leave it um, until it's too late, basically. And then another very widely shared idea, actually across all stakeholders, was the idea of con connectivity and community. So the word community came up a lot, and no matter from which stakeholder group they were, whether it was tech employees who just came to the city and wanted to get involved, whether it was the homeless community who actually attended the workshop as well and felt really left out, everybody wanted to have their voice heard in the downtown Kitchener community. So based on that, right now, sorry, I'm going to go over time a tiny bit, uh, we're hosting a citizen photography exercise. It's called Photo Voice. And we're basically inviting people who live or work or are connected to downtown Kitchener to take 10 photos of places that matter to them and of uh, places or things in downtown Kitchener that represent how they experience urban change. Which, by the way, if this sounds interesting to you, come talk to me after. So we're going to use these photos to look through people's eyes, basically, at the city that they live in and work in and see what matters to them and what values they hold really close to their heart, as well as what struggles they're facing. And so for the third stage of our project, it wouldn't be complete without an exhibition because the whole point of this is to share and to generate solutions collaboratively. So we want to open this exhibit up to the whole public, no matter if they participated or not, just so they can see what came out of it and how we can move towards the solutions aspect of our project title. Thank you very much. and being part of one of the Photo Voice contributors. Uh, Dasha has uh, created a, there's a blog on the Hive uh, website, so hivewr.ca, and there's a link to a Google form, or of course you can talk to her here tonight. I also have old school handouts. <laughs> awesome. All right, does anyone have any questions for Dasha about the project? Yeah, Victoria. Are you planning on presenting to council and you're done your research? I think that would be an amazing uh, five-minute That was definitely one thing that we talked about with the research team. So yeah, if, the, if people are open to that, we really want to share with as many people as possible. Yeah. 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 I didn't know about those people, but that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, like there'll Where's certainly be a lot of different <laughs> <laughs> um, So um, I guess my question is about the use of photo voice as a qualitative um, data mm -hmm. measurement tool. Um, why is that as opposed to other um, collect like information about the downtown? So I think one of the things that pushed us towards photo voice is that it's, re it's a really equalizing method of gathering data. So people who, because we are providing cameras for people who don't have them, and then we're also, if you do have a camera, you're welcome to use your own. So it's a way that no matter if, you know, you can't speak English, you can't write up a paper or answer a survey very well, you can still take a photo of something that matters to you. And we're going to, after people take the photos, we're going to work with them to develop captions to explain why they took the photo and what's important to them to make sure that the information is accurate. But that part's going to occur face to face, which I think is a lot easier, uh, a lot uh, more, better to get accurate information, especially, you know, there's a language barrier or something like that. Is there a question? I had, um, just wanted more information about the organization, like who, who's coordinating all of this? For sure. So we're a group of researchers. Um, actually, Carla, right here, is the lead on this project. Um, so we are researchers from the University of Waterloo, um, as well as uh, we have uh, somebody at Ryerson and somebody from the University of Northern British Columbia. I know that seems far, but he used to live in Kitchener. That's why he's involved as well as Hive as a, our community partner and we're kind of like all pulled our efforts together to try to get this project going. And what department do you? Uh, I study political science. I'm a student. Um, Carla's in uh, recreational major studies. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Alice Cecile. Um, I am an ecologist who uh, somehow ended up doing machine learning and it's a lot of fun. I'm working on a, founding a founding a company called Dreaming Machines. We're looking at um, doing 
machine learning for artists to allow them to find content and remix it in totally, totally creative and unimaginable ways. So, there's a lot of hype around machine learning right now, um, and but a lot of the traditional uses there's are basically entirely centered around prediction. If you have something that you really, really care about, like revenue or conversion rate or what's that tag on that image, you can you can build a machine learning pipeline and you can go and you can classify it things, and you can regress things, you can optimize it, and it works really, really fantastic. That's a picture of uh, the architecture of. Uh, of one of Google's ImageNet uh, neural networks. It's really, really complicated, it does a fantastic job, but all it does is it takes a photo and says, okay, this is probably a bird. Like, that's, that, that's all it does. And so, if you have a bunch of data, and you don't really have necessarily the really well-formed, clean question, you're like, okay, I guess machine learning is useless to me. Like, that's how it's presented, where it says you have to have, you have to have something to predict. But I, I wanna tell you that, no, 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 that's not true. Machine learning is a really, really powerful tool, and fundamentally a way of conceptualizing things, not, uh, not just a way to, uh, not just a magical black box. So, the first, uh, the first really, really fundamental concept is that in addition to taking your data and saying, okay, this is this category or this is going to give us this output, um, machine learning can also do things called generative models, where you feed it a bunch of examples of the category that you're looking for, and um, and it says, okay, I understand this category, uh, I understand this type of thing, and then it will give you out new examples of whatever type you're looking at. In this case, it's in this case, it's uh, glass uh, designs of, uh, uh, of drinking glasses. And so, what you can do is, once you have this generative model, you can say, okay, I'm looking for uh, for a drinking glass that is particularly elegant or particularly tall, and you can vary around the parameters and and see what it suggests. So this works too if you have even like. More, more abstract or more like businessy data. Like if you have a bunch of like customer profiles, if you build a generative model, you can say, okay, show me what a potential customer would look like. Show me what a potential customer who's 26 year old, 26 years old and female and um, interested in art, and and then give me a bunch of samples of that so I can try and understand how my data works. So that's super neat and can lead to a lot, a lot of powerful things. The next trick that's really really neat is. Um, you, you can use machine learning to basically take your input space, take your, your raw data, and map it to some meaningful representation. So a meaningful representation is one that's nice and, nice and small, it's nice and sparse, but also that has relationships that make sense. So in this case, this is taking a bunch of words and saying, um, and trying to map those in, into, a, into a space. So in this case, we have two dimensions of that. And, um, on the, on the y-axis there, if you look closely, you can see that's related to status, right? And on the x-axis, you can see clearly that it's gender. And so, what you can do is you can think of these as, as points, as points in vector space, for example. And you can add and subtract and reason by analogy. So, say we were to take, take king and subtract the vector for man, and add the vector for woman, and then look and say, okay, what's the nearest example? You get queen back out. And you can do that with as long as you can generate those representations, you can do the, that sort of analogical reasoning, no matter what sort of data you have, and generate insights in a really, really intuitive and informative way. So, the final thing is something is a really, really fantastic trick. So, this is something called style transfer. So, if you look closely, this was generated um, almost entirely automatically. Um, so, what they did is they said, "Okay, we have a we have a children's book illustrating a bunch of dinosaurs, and then we have a." awesome botanical book with a whole bunch of different flowers. And what they said is, okay, neural networks, go and learn with the content and style of these two things independently, okay? And so it learned the content of the dinosaurs and the style of the, the style of the flowers. And then it just said, okay, now swap the style onto here, and it automatically generates things like this. And so there's a lot of potential for that in whatever the heck you want. Like say you want to have a, you have a speech synth synthesizer and you want to go and have them have them speak in a different accent, or have a different gender, or say you want music in music in a different genre, or like all sorts of things like that. Where you, as long as you understand the space and you, your model has a good understanding of the space, you can go and move around and manipulate it in a meaningful way. So, anyways, I hope that opens your mind to uh, possibilities of machine learning, and hopefully, you guys can uh, find cool uses for it. So yeah, for reference, that URL is dreamingmachines.github.io. So if you want to check us out, you can go.
go on there and uh, sign up for stuff. We're, we're just getting started, so we don't have a ton yet, but if you want to hear about what we're actually doing, sign up there. Code. What it is, is a set of instructions that you give from one thing into another. Um, it's all that it is. And you can construct those algorithms in a completely elaborate um, program, software, a whole bunch of things like this. But at its core, code is all about instructions. Now, most of the types of instructions that you're familiar with are either with you and your loved ones or teachers and learners. But one of the things I was looking at for uh, activities such as this is subverting that paradigm. So rather than me being the uh, instructor, I would rather be the learner. Now, what we have here is uh, the finest robot costume I have ever created. Uh, for Gordium Alloy, it is amazing. What I'm going to be doing with this is I'm going to put it on my head, and I've um, connected a few electronics prototyping modules called Little Bits. And instructions can be set with that. There'll be some lights, there'll be some sound. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to generate an algorithm or a set of instructions that's going to get me from here all the way ever to uh, over, sorry over to my uh, my pint over there. So uh, Prina, come <laughs> over here. Um, explain to the audience here what are some of the things I can do. I can walk over, but where can I walk over? I could what's straight? Do, I mean, I I I could do. I'm gonna try that right now. I, this is me walking straight. Like <laughs> this. Oh. <laughs> so when it comes to um, issuing algorithms, it's very very important to be very precise with your instructions. One of the beautiful things about things like computers is that they will do exactly what you say every single time. And rest assured, me as a robot will be um, a much better listener than me in real life. I, I promise. <laughs> so um, we have this um, this um, controller here. These are little bits. Uh, we have a uh, pro library at the museum, but there's also libraries at uh, KPL as well, and um, they bring them out and do some really, really cool things with them. So um, we're going to map a few functions to the buttons here. Now, some of the things that I can do as a person, obviously I can walk forward, I can turn around, I can do things like this. I can yell and shout and pat my head and things like this, but I think there's only a few sets of instructions that are going to be useful to me in my objective. One of those, of course, is walking. As a biped, I'm able to do that. Now, if I were a car or a dog or anything like that, I'd have a different set of functions that would define some of the things that I could do. So, we're going to map one of the buttons to walk. We're going to map one of the buttons to turn, and finally, we're going to map one of the buttons to. Um, picking up the object that's in front of me. We'll say for the sake of this argument, I'm capable of like seeing my environment on all the things that robots typically have challenges doing. So there's your, um, your controller. <laughs> I am a robot. <laughs> and the circuitry, this is actually quite simple. Um, there's a wireless transmitter in my helmet right now and a wireless transmitter in here. Uh, give it a uh, test for Okay, so this button, right. Um, next button. Ah, music to my ears. And then the last one. Okay, so we have a light here, a light here, and then a buzzer down here. Um, which light should this be? What do you want that to do? Walk, okay. So left is walk. Okay, what about um, the stop? Yes. Stop, stop okay. Uh, what about the last one? Turn right, okay. <laughs> Turn right, okay. Um, so um, again, my objective is to get from here to there and pick up my beer. Alright, ready? Yeah. Do I start now? Yes. I think we need 
need to debug this program a little bit. Um, <laughs> the whole function was not um, communicated to me as a whole robot. Um, and that's, of course, picking up this. Now, we only have three buttons. So there's only three functions, right? Not necessarily. So um, do a little bit of map. Um, you can um, map multiple buttons to a single function. So, um, but we uh, turn on both lights and have that as picking things up. Excellent. <laughs> and we have done this. Um, quick note before uh, before taking questions. Um, this uh, this activity was uh, was done to um, to illustrate um, specifically the uh, the logo probing, uh, programming language and the precepts of uh, constructionism, which is um, Seymour Peppy's um, uh, Demand Mount to Psychology model of how we um, how we learn as uh, as people. It's a uh, learning by doing type of paradigm. And um, logo, which is a turtle graphics based um, uh, programming language, was his way to be able to uh, facilitate this. My angle was to try to make it a little bit more accessible to, um, to families specifically to subvert that notion of uh, who is learner, who is teacher, and to make it a little bit more fun. Uh, one of my favorite parts about this is um, it gets audiences thinking about what things can do. And I think um, in terms of programming, figuring out exactly the scope of activities that are possible before um, being able to uh, tackle a project is very, very important to be able to make that happen. Uh, thanks so much. For our robot. <laughs> I'm a human now, I swear. You're home. <laughs> What's coming up next at the Underground Studio? Uh, so uh, we're unveiling our Maker Passport program, which is a 45-minute workshop activity that um, is um, basically learning some uh, some practical skills. So soldering, um, 3D modeling, um, using Arduinos for basic programming, things like that. It's a $5 entrance fee, so we're trying to make it as accessible as possible to audiences. But um, Hopefully after that we uh, continue to ramp up our uh, our mandate and our questions. That's an excellent question. Um, right now, um, the way that we uh, try to approach um, audiences like this is um, we try to have multiple people on staff that are able to accommodate for initial needs. So um, Rob, um, who is uh, over here with me, he's at the um, Underground Studio as well. Um, if we have a camp program or something like this, um, typically we have um, one person that's doing um, the um, the audience space interaction, and then um, we try to identify um, audiences that might require some additional um, needs and um, provide the additional support that way. That's our approach. Awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, can I get our speakers to come up to the front for a final round of applause and the last question? Yeah.